So um, just to start off, I'm delighted to be here once again. Had the pleasure to, uh, to stop in and, and see you guys uh, about five, six years ago. And um, I can never turn down an invitation from my friend Jeff. Um, I will just uh, make the observation that I am the last person between you and lunch. <laughs> so I promise you the next two hours will go quickly. Um, all right. So you've heard the old adage, uh, what a difference a year makes. Well, what a difference 10 months can make. This was last October, uh, first week of October, and I was scheduled to come up here and present at, uh, I guess, your quarterly meeting. Um, but this happened. This was Hurricane Matthew, and it was a Cat 4, uh, for a little while, it was a Cat 5 hurricane, major weather system. Right, came right up the East Coast, and I think may have affected you guys a little bit up here, um, to a certain extent. Um, hopefully no one owns property, particularly coastal property in Florida here. Um, if not, um, or if you do, you were, you were affected by this. But I was planning to come up, and I was talking to Jeff um, a little bit afterwards, and um, we were hit very hard. Um, a lot of impact to low-lying areas, a lot of flooding, a lot of structural damage, a lot of follow-up, um, really a state of emergency for um, a great portion of the state. And um, so I was talking to Jeff, and, and Jeff um, has really high standards, and he's like, really, a weather event, and you're not gonna be able to come up? I mean, come on, what is this? <laughs> so he cut me a little bit of slack and, and invited me up um, to, to stop up now. So anyways, so what I would like to do um, in the next uh, half hour or so is kind of give you guys a little bit of an overview of the department, our mission, some of the unique and, uh, and key challenges that we face, but also what led us on our lean journey. Why did we even go there to begin with? Um, what did we hope to get out of it? Um, what benefits have accrued, and then uh, finally we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up with a, a few lessons learned that hopefully you guys will find helpful. So to start off, um, the mission of DEP is to preserve, protect, and enhance Florida's environment and natural resources for its people. Pretty straightforward. We actually have some amazing priceless natural assets in our state. Um, in fact, we have one of the largest concentrations of freshwater natural springs found anywhere on the planet. Right? A physical challenge is a lot of the spring shed is located, um, any geologists here? In a very karst area where there's limestone and the soil is very porous, so that provides openings for pollutants and contaminants to find their way down. So that's a top priority for the agency. So how do we protect these and, and all the other natural assets we have in the state? Well, one key way, one major tool that we have in our toolbox is to engage with a large number of diverse facilities and organizations on a daily basis, right? Um, these are facilities that we have permits with, um, that we regulate, that we monitor, but also um, we like to think of ourselves as problem solvers so that um, you know the, the goal is always compliance but can we push the envelope a little bit and see if we can go further and minimize um, each facility's impact to the environment and the number of facilities it's really it's in the thousands and it really runs the spectrum from the very large and complex right, pulp and paper mills phosphate mines large utilities manufacturing plants of course um, I see that I'm at the Northrop Grumman podium here um, we actually have a Northrop Grumman facility in St. Augustine um, they're doing quite well by the way um, we like working with them medical facilities um, health care is on the increase in Florida and um, there's a lot of new large medical complexes that use hazardous materials um, and need to sometimes have a little more guidance and support so that they manage those materials materials in a, um, in a in appropriate manner. A um, couple of large military bases. In my district we have two large naval bases, NAS Jax and um, Naval Station Mayport on the mouth of the St. John's River. Um, these are basically large cities within larger urban areas and presents additional layers of challenges for us. 
from a business perspective, I thought I would put this slide in. Um, I kind of look through the lens of uh, business and ROI often, um, but, but I'll make the statement that Florida's economy depends on a healthy and sustainable environment. Right? Two of our top economic drivers, tourism and agriculture, require clean water, land, and air. Furthermore, we think it's a wise investment. Right? Not just for us, but for future generations. Um, and that's important when we try to attract new high-tech firms and new businesses uh, that are interested in investing capital and uh, expanding plants and uh, creating jobs. Just a little uh, side note on this slide. Um, I put the, uh, the image of Ben Franklin. Um, I have a 14-year-old daughter who's a huge fan of this Broadway um, musical Hamilton. You may have heard of this, right? So she saw this slide, she's like, Daddy, you really need to put Hamilton's face up there. And then so we, we got into a little debate that, well, Franklin is really technically on a higher value of currency than Hamilton. So <laughs> she was sort of, all right, kind of went with it. All right, a little bit about our agency and our structure. Um, so Florida, as you know, is a very large state. Um, we have over 19 million customers to proudly serve each and every day. That's a lot of area to cover. That's a lot of people to work with. Um, so our headquarters is in Tallahassee, where the state capital is located. But DEP is largely a decentralized agency um, in that a lot of the, uh, the important day-to-day -day work happens out in the six regulatory district offices right throughout the state. Um, I actually manage the Northeast District, which is this like purple area here. Um, as Sean said, we covered 19 counties. Um, it's a large area. It's uh, about 20% of the state, um, over 2 million people, and as I said, thousands of facilities to work with and monitor and, um, and help. Trust me when I say we are not bursting at the seams with excess or surplus resources. In my office, we have about 90 full-time employees we have gone through a restructuring and a downsizing. Maybe some of y'all have gone through that process as well. Um, of those 90, um, about 50 are part of what we call our compliance assistance team, or CAP. And these are the folks that go out and do inspections. These are the boots on the ground, folks that go and walk around, take notes, um, hopefully provide help and assistance. Um, we have four regulatory programs. Right? Air, water, waste, and what we call ERP, which is basically wetlands and state lands. And so if you do the math on that real quick, that's less than one person per program per district. Right? So uh, the bench is a little thin, so we have to optimize these resources. Growth. One of the biggest challenges that we face. Um, over the last few decades, Florida has seen tremendous growth. And by the way, we like that. We encourage it, we support it. But the reality is that that can create new layers of challenges for us to protect the resources that we are empowered to safeguard, right? That drives up demand for our service, right? And uh, so, these are, uh, these are key considerations. Our workload has been increasing, especially in the last, um, the last expansion, starting eh, around 2011, 2012. We've seen a, a rapid increase in the number of permit applications, projects, requests for information and services, citizen complaints. You know, we have to respond to every single complaint that comes in that may be related to something we manage. Um, and so all of that challenges our ability to deliver a high level of service to our customers. Okay, so I'm going to go back in time a little bit. Anybody recognize that photo, by the way? Any movie bus here? Cone Brothers? Seen it before? Oh, brother. You got it. Oh, brother, I thought George, George Clooney. So anyways, back at the end of 2005, 2006, when I arrived at DEP, um, we, we kind of looked around and, and we saw we were, we were fa falling farther and farther behind. We weren't keeping up with this incredible workload that was coming in um, during that, that expansion phase. Um, and 
Um, maybe more importantly, we weren't getting additional resources. Not much more funding, no more new programs. Um, it was pretty much make do with what you have. So we were thinking about that and it, the light bulb went on and we, we realized, okay, if this is as good as it's going to get and we're not getting more, um, we need to figure out a different way to do business. We need to look at our processes more closely. We need to be more effective, more efficient, um, and get better. Um, so I want to take a step back, and it's kind of fitting. Uh, I put this slide up here. What if we didn't change? What if we assumed back in 06 that we were as good as we were ever going to be? Um, that that was just the way things were, and we would hope for the best. Um, some interesting quotes, and kind of fitting that we're in the uh, Museum of Electronics here. Computers of the future may weigh no more than one and a half tons. Hmm, 1949, okay. This telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communications. Devices apparently of no value to us. We don't like their sounds and guitar music is on the way out, 1962. And then finally, maybe the best one, everything that can be invented has been invented. The head of the US Patent Office, 1899. Wow, incredibly bold statements, right? And they were all wrong. So, change is a good thing. Change is necessary. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about our lean journey. So, we started to look around at a couple of different uh, improvement programs, a couple different quality systems. We looked at Six Sigma, realized we don't generate enough permits or enough units of anything, really, to do the statistical analysis that's kind of required for that. Um, we looked at a couple other programs. Through luck, maybe serendipity, <laughs> we found lean. Uh, just sort of fell into our laps. And as I said, we needed a way to not just improve our service, optimize limited resources, find new efficiencies, but also a new way to foster innovation and harness uh, the best ideas and, and, and to kind of max out the potential um, in our office. For us, lean is an exceptionally good fit. Um, when I mentioned Locke a moment ago, I, I, I really mean it. We actually have um, sort of a similar organization in Jacksonville called the Jacksonville Lean Consortium. So it was founded uh, about 15 years ago, and it, it's basically made up of manufacturers, service providers, some government agencies, a couple of NGOs, basically all working together to collaborate to learn, to share best practices, um, to develop relationships, and it's, uh, it's been incredibly beneficial to us. Um, just a couple things, uh, I guess I would put this on the HR side of the ledger uh, that Mike talked about. It certainly empowers our staff, improves our processes, and uh, decreases waste. All of that enhances our ability to achieve environmental protection objectives and deliver top-notch service to the public. So how have we used it? Um, we've used it in a wide variety of areas. We've actually had well over 100 projects um, and we've done storyboards for most of them to kind of capture um, the challenges, uh, the problem statement, the best ideas, the SOPs, everything that came out of those events um, sort of as a repository and we've made that electronically available to everybody throughout the agency. Just a couple key things. Um, it's improved our ability to respond to spills and emergencies. I'm going to talk about that, that in just a moment. It's helped us to streamline our permitting process, right? And helped us to, uh, to increase compliance rates at facilities. So the second bullet, streamlining our permitting process. So here's a real world example. Um, we got a call in the last few weeks about a, um, a major global company that potentially wants to invest in the state of Florida. Um, a whole lot of questions to be answered, um, a lot to sort out. One of the things that they are looking at is what's the regulatory climate like? What are the regulators like? Um, what's the permitting process? 
Um, how long is it? Are these guys solutions oriented? Are they going to roll up their sleeves and work with us? Or are they going to kind of sit back passively and just hope for the best? Back in the day, it used to take us weeks, sometimes months, to generate certain types of permits, particularly those that have impacts to wetlands right, and state lands. Um, with lean and with some of the process improvements that we've put in place, we received an application for a 300 acre green site that has substantial wetlands impacts that you have to mitigate for, by the way, in our state, I think you may hear too, meaning no net loss. So if you're gonna impact wetlands, you have to pay for bank credit somewhere else. So, you know, it, uh, it evens out. We received the application on a Tuesday. Thursday afternoon, about 48 hours, we issued the permit and was out the door. Um, we would not have been able to do that without starting lean a few years ago. So, and I need to say, that permit has as stringent or more environmental protections than any of the permits we had in the past. But we just took out all the waste in the process, the non-value activities, to give that to the customer, to give a better high quality product to the customer. Um, so, pretty impressive. And that, that helps to make us more competitive, you know, as different states are, are vying for investment from not just um, US companies, but global facilities as well. Increasing compliance rates. Um, all of our six districts uh, over the last couple of years has, have started to measure the rates of compliance at all of our facilities throughout the state. We are now seeing some of the highest rates of compliance that we've ever measured. In fact, um, my district is uh, about 96% right now, um, which, is, which is impressive. You can never realistically get to 100 because we know there's always going to be issues or there will always be people that mm, don't get it or don't want to get it. Um, but for those that do, that want to work with us, we'll help them. So, impressive results. As I mentioned, faster processes, higher quality work products, um, improved customer service, right? Higher level of staff engagement. Folks uh, on my team are, are passionate about the work we do. Uh, most of the folks that work for the government um, are really into the whole idea of public service to begin with. So when they see they're making a difference and uh, they're having a difference in outcomes, that gets them really excited and fired up. Um, and if you slice out a lot of the waste and inefficiencies and redundancies that are so often uh, the case in government processes that frees up a lot of folks to do truly mission critical work, right? And that's led to better environmental outcomes. So, so I mentioned um, we've improved our ability to respond to spills. Um, spills happen, unfortunately, um, but I'll give you a good real world example. So. Um, in Jacksonville, we have a large utility that provides wastewater and drinking water services. And they have miles and miles of buried uh, wastewater pipes. Um, and this piping system has been in the ground for years, in some cases decades. They spring leaks, or there's pump failures, or electrical issues. Um, so spills do happen. So we need to work with the utility, we need to you know, gather up teams to go out and basically assess, provide assistance, support, um, do everything we can to try to, um, to correct the situation as quickly as possible. So this was one of the first events we had in our lean journey. And a number of these folks um, are members of our team, but we did kind of a, um, uh, I think a, a, pretty, a pretty cool thing, and it wasn't my idea. Someone on our team said, why don't we invite JEA, the, elec the electric utility, to come in to work with us on the, on the project. We regulate JEA, and in fact, if, if they have issues, if they have large spills or, or problems, um, we are empowered and we have to take enforcement, right? So there's the government uh, regulator side of us and um, they are the permittee. But they love the idea. They came in, they participated, because ultimately we want to get to the same endpoint. 
um, you know, how can we respond the most effectively, the most consistently, and deliver the highest level of value? Um, and before we started, I should say, we had no SOPs, we, no, we had no standardization. All of this led to um, incredible results. What we did, I think, is, is kind of cool. Um, just to kind of um, get our arms around a baseline initially, we set up the team into two groups and we basically had a, a surprise mock spill event. And we had both teams go out and, and do what they thought they needed to do to respond effectively to the spill. That revealed more than 24 steps and a whole lot of inconsistency in the process. Right? So we map that between current and future state. You guys have seen this, I'm sure. We analyzed it. And we were able to capture some amazing results. We created a new flowchart, new SOPs, specialized response kits that each of our vehicles would have, chain of custody forms we never had before, um, a dedicated phone line system so that we could have better communications, and an updated data entry system so that the information we were collecting about impacts to waterways was captured and it was um, entered into our system in an accurate manner. So kind of cool stuff. Before and after stats. So before, um, as I mentioned, we had over 24 steps after the event down to 11. Better than 50% savings in steps. Lead time. You know, we cut almost an hour and a half off of uh, what our lead time was initially. Uh, over a 30% savings. Initially, we had no standard process. Afterwards, we did, and we still have it today. Before I wrap up, I want to also make the point that um, lean for us has a very um, close association with environmental protection, and actually, the goals are not just compatible, but they're complementary, right? Because the very notion of identifying and eliminating waste, right, aligns with pollution prevention and sustainability. So it supports our goals. And we also see that there's a high correlation between organizations that follow lean practices and environmental performance. We like to see that. Other lean initiatives. So lean is supported by EPA. And as many as 30 state environmental, 30 state environmental agencies throughout the US. And in a manufacturing context, according to EPA, significant environmental benefits typically ride the coattails because of, of the lean focus and, uh, and methods and, and facilities. So for us, the results have been uh, incredibly impressive. Um, just within a few months of uh, starting our journey, we substantially cut our perm permit application backlogs, right? Reduce lead times for permit reviews by over 50%. Decrease the complexity of a lot of the applications and the forms that the public had to fill out. And improve the consistency of the permits um, and made staff more available for mission critical work. All of that was done um, while improving staff morale and without sacrificing any environmental protection goals. Truly a win-win. And to close, I would say um, it's uh, maybe a little overused, but I will say our implementation of Lean has been a game changer in our office, and um, we've seen incredible benefits over the years. Um, and it's exciting to watch people, you know, kind of get really into projects and attacking opportunities. Once upon a time, um, folks in our office, you know, if they identified a problem or there was a mistake, you know, kind of sweep it away and ignore it. Um, now, the culture is more like people look for those issues, for those problems, because they want to make improvements. So that's uh, really, really cool to see. And with that, I will uh, open it up for any questions you guys might have. Thank you. Yes? Can you elaborate on staff morale? Can I elaborate on staff morale? Yes. Things did you implement or just to boost, enhance? 
Sure. Well, I would say with any new initiative in any organization, um, there's a huge opportunity, right? If you set it up right, if you frame it, um, if you communicate it, I think in an effective way um, so that folks see what the value is, um, there's an opportunity to create some buzz, some energy, some excitement. What we kind of did was we looked to find um, what I'll call our type A performers, you know, sort of a, every organization has probably a somewhat normal distribution of folks. I think I heard it before from the first speaker. You know, you have your early adopters, your type A's who really like to be challenged, take some risks. For us, um, we identified those folks early on to sort of form the core of our lean team and sort of communicate and spread the word. Um, we also um, used a little bit of bragging rights or peer pressure. So if one team did an event and, and had some incredible results in one program, um, we made sure they spread the word so that the other teams that maybe hadn't scheduled Kaizen events would, uh, would, would schedule some things and, and, and get talking about that. Um, morale is, uh, I, I think, very high um, for us and I think there's a lot of freedom and flexibility for folks to identify opportunities. Um, one of the things we have never done was we've never set quotas for the number of projects we want done in a quarter or a year or by department or any of that. Um, we really left it open to staff to find what those opportunities are. Because of that, they feel like they're connected to the outcomes. Yes? Were you pulling people out of the field to do Kaizen events that were multi-day Kaizen events? Yes, um, did we do multi-day Kaizen events? Yes, we have, we've done, really we've run the gamut from you know, three to five days. I think five days has been about the max. Um, for us, kind of the three-day rule, um, I don't know what, fish, laundry, uh, Kaizen events, uh, returns start to diminish after day three, for us, maybe not for other organizations. Um, morale, um, the excitement, the energy, you want people to bring their best. Um, they also have to enjoy it. You know, if this feels like work or it's something just to do, um, the results mm, may, not, may, may not dazzle you at the end. Um, we have found that if we can carve out a day, maybe two days max right now, um, that's usually sort of our tipping point. Um, beyond that, then folks, no, I'm busy, or I've got other things, or I've got field commitments, or I think I'm going on AL that week, you know. Um, so we're, we're, we try to be very kind of uh, sensitive and aware of that and schedule accordingly. Hopefully that helps. Did I answer your question? I was just uh, wondering about your um, mandates for your response times, or if you had a spill and you had staff that was in a Kaizen event, what was your coverage for response? Great question. So one of the things in selecting that first, you know, sort of core team to, to make lean happen in our office was we had one master scheduler who could talk to supervisors and make sure that we had adequate coverage throughout so that if something happened or a crisis or an event um, that folks could actually step out and so that's a great question um, especially when your bench is thin um, you want to make sure you can get the uh, the day-to-day -day stuff done while you're huddled up other questions yes sir since you've been doing this for a while are you finding that are you circling back now to some of your original projects and doing round two and then I guess it gets harder, there's less low hanging fruit, so it gets a little tougher the second go or second, third go around. How are you finding that's working out? Here's, here's what I would say. Um, you know, I think real, the, realistically, I think with any new initiative, there's, there's ultra high potential to create excitement, to create a lot of energy buzz, all of that. Um, you know, initially that, you'll have that burst and it'll, it'll go for a while and then you'll hit a plateau. And so, how do you get to the next level, I think, is, is one of the challenges. Um, to be honest, uh, as far as coming back to round two and making sure we sustain these, these results and these improvements, um, typically what we do is we schedule 30, 60, 90 day follow-ups after we have an event. Um, and that kind of keeps us on track. 
but unfortunately we're not, I'll just say we're not staffed up enough to do auditing to go back and see three, four, five years down the line. Are we still doing what we said we were doing? Are the fixes still taking, taking place? Are you still following those SOPs you took time to develop? Um, I would say 80-20 rule, probably 80% we are. Um, the 20%, and that may be the important stuff, um, question mark. So, other questions? Yes, sir. <coughs> With uh, Lean, we always talk about the need for leadership, buy-in, and so forth. So, mm -hmm. is this separate? solely within your northeast district or has it spread now to other districts in Florida? Yeah, no, it's spread to, uh, to the other districts and um, we actually have a, a monthly lean, meter, lean leader conference call for about an hour so all the other districts can call in. And um, One of the things we like to do is um, we like to bring in folks that are lean practitioners from outside organizations. Um, we find that staff um, get inspired by hearing that people are continuing in their journeys. And a lot of times these are companies that we work with or that we regulate. Um, so it's good for us to get to know them on a personal level. Um, but yeah, uh, after we, uh, we started doing this, others were kind of um, curious initially, you know, what are you guys doing up there in Jacksonville and can we get together? And there's been an incredible uh, sharing of best practices and, and believe me, we, we, we try to remain humble and open-minded so that, you know, if we see a really good idea that happens in Fort Myers or Orlando or Pensacola, um, we want to know about that. We want to take it in and, and learn from it so we can get better. So. Yeah. Related question: yeah. Are a lot of other state agencies picking up on this? I don't know. Um, there's probably uh, close to 20 state agencies. I think to a certain extent, most of them are following some sort of quality principles. I mean, I'll make the I'll make the general statement that now. Um, government is in general being held to a higher level of accountability, right? And performance and transparency, right? Not just in Florida, but I'm guessing here and, and, and throughout the US. Um, so I would say chances are if you were to go to DOT or you were to go to other agencies, Department of Health, you would see some sort of quality system in place. Good. Yes. We all know that just because you write it down, like an SOP, hmm. doesn't necessarily mean you follow it. I'm curious, you being a regulator, how well you think your agency does in, you mentioned a lot of your improvements were updating SOPs, hmm. modernizing SOPs. How well does the regulated agency actually follow their own SOPs? Hmm. That's a great question. How, do, how well do we follow our SOPs, or do we follow them? Um, I think pretty well, I'll say that. Um, we um, have very good managers. We have an incredible team, I'll just start with that. And the folks that um, are engaged in Kaizen events that generate SOPs generally have a, a high level of management buy-in and support. Um, unlike the plant manager that maybe says, go do, um, and let me know how that works out. So they're very familiar with what the end result is and what the work products are. So there's a really good communication between you know, the ES2s and ES1s and the administrators of, of each team and section. So that's, that's a great question. Um, be curious if we were to audit ourselves and like have somebody come in, how that would look. But anyways. Thanks, President. Uh, <coughs> seems you are the state agency. So how about your funding? Is, uh, is your funding come back from the federal or is it hmm. the state? Hmm. And was the federal funding reduction impact your state agency? Hmm. That's a great question. So it's about funding. Uh, the question is, uh, hmm. uh, for the global warming, hmm. uh, do you, when you monitor, do you start seeing the sea level impact, ways impact hmm. your state? Hmm. Was there any like this seawater and storm coming mm. in start contaminating, damaging your land mm. and also the uh, coastland, waterfront? You guys uh, control the permit mm. for the construction because we see a lot of mm. the disaster storms and mm. then a lot of insurance. Mm. 
cause to happen. Hmm. So okay. I heard the news that says that some place should not be construct buildings and hmm. now start to build and hmm. they cause troubles. Hmm. Okay, so two questions, one on funding and the other on climate change. I'm gonna take the hard one first, which is the funding question. Um, <laughs> so yes, we, are, we, we do receive some federal funds, but also we receive state funds as well. Um, and uh, we pass through some of those monies to um, local governments and utilities so that they can upgrade their systems and, um, and facilities. Um, we haven't really seen um, much of an impact yet in terms of changes at the federal level. Um, that's possible, but um, I can say um, in terms of day-to-day -day operations, we're still seeing um, pretty much the same level of inspections. So we run federally delegated programs from EPA um, for has waste, for example. Um, but they reserve the right to come down and just randomly pick really any of our facilities and, and go and do an inspection. We're still seeing a pretty aggressive um, inspection presence. Um, and so I think that's a good thing. Um, we work with them and kind of compare notes at the end. So, um, so we haven't really seen a change there. Um, your second question uh, on, um, on climate change. So I mentioned in the, the first slide about Hurricane Matthew, which was I incredibly damaging to a large area, coastal, air coastal areas. Um, in fact, there's one community in, in my district that has lost probably close to 100 feet of beachfront, and their condos are sort of right, right there on, on, on the dune, and the dune has been washed away, and the ocean is uh, seeming, seemingly heading west, right? Um, we have some pretty well-defined rules and requirements about armoring and structuring and there's a lot of um, there's a, a lot of uh, things we don't want to cross over that might impact imperiled species like sea turtles for example so we have to be very very sensitive not to go too far um, with the permits and the design and the structure and, and all of that but the other side of the equation is we have to help people and if there's a way that we can um, in an environmentally friendly manner which is rule compliant, help them to better buffer their properties, uh, we will do that. And we've been doing that for the last uh, 10 months on an aggressive schedule. So hopefully that helps. Other, are you about, about there? One more. One more. One more question. Okay. Is there one more? <coughs> are, we, are we there? All right, great. Thank you, Greg. Thank you so much. <laughs>